Good morning. I pray you all had a wonderful new year. I also pray the Lord will strengthen and mature us this year to further his kingdom. As a church, we had the opportunity to impact our neighborhood, to impact the lives of those around us. Before we get going with the lesson, I'd like to open us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, as we embark on this new year, I pray that your hand would be on us. I pray that we would glorify you. I pray that you would strengthen your word going into this community. I pray that you would use us as your hands and feet. I pray that you would bless now the, the lesson, the reading of your word, and what you have for us from what you gave to Paul to give to the Corinthian church. I pray your hand would be on us. Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. So today we're picking back up with our study in 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 14, verses 1 to 25. Please turn in your Bibles or in your electronic applications. In this chapter, Paul is contrasting prophecy with speaking in tongues. However, before we dive into chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, I'd like to remind us of where we were in Paul's letter to the Corinthians so that we can pick it back up as a reference. In chapter 13, the love chapter, Paul addresses how the Christians should exhibit love. He addressed what it is and what it isn't. It is patient and it is kind. It isn't selfish or jealous and it keeps no record of wrongs. It never rejoices in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It endures, it believes, it hopes, and it never fails. In the last verse, it is contrasted with faith and hope. And love is found to be superior. But why? Why is that? Well, faith and hope will fade away. When we see the Lord face to face, there will be no need for hope or faith, but God's love will endure forever. So picking back up now to where we are in chapter 14, verses 1 to 5, I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Paul writes to the Corinthians, Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification for exhortation and consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. Now, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy, and greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues. Unless he interprets so that the church may receive edification. We're instructed to pursue here love, not just to show love. Pursuit implies action and effort. It is not lazy. It doesn't just sit around and wait for things to happen. We're to actively love people and to show God's love to them by serving them, just as was done this past week here in the church. Paul also directs the Corinthians to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. As a reminder, from 1 Corinthians 12, the spiritual gifts are wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, working miracles, prophecy, distinguishing of spirits, tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. 
A very important truth to remember from chapter 12, verse 1, is that the Holy Spirit decides what spiritual gift or gifts we're given. We don't get to pick on our own. Verse 11 says, The same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. I think Paul's humanity is showing up here since already he's told us that it's up to the Holy Spirit what gift or gifts we have. It's interesting here that Paul contrasts only two of the spiritual gifts. Some biblical scholars believe that this gift is one that some in the Corinthian church prized above all other gifts. That's why Paul had to address speaking in tongues here. The Corinthians were using the gift incorrectly to satisfy their own egos. They were puffing themselves up. So Paul had to address the issue. Those who speak in tongues speak to the Lord, as it says, not to men and women, but one who prophesies speaks to men and women or to the church. We often think of prophecy as predicting the future, and often that's what it is. Throughout the Old Testament, the Messiah's coming was foretold or prophesied. Sometimes, however, a prophet's message is not necessarily about future events. It is, however, always a message from the Lord to be delivered to his people. The way it is used in 1 Corinthians here 14 is more in line with this view of prophecy. Verse 3 gives three reasons for prophecy. They are edification, exhortation, and consolation. And you may ask, okay, what, what do those mean? Well, edification means instruction or the improvement of spiritual knowledge. Exhortation is a warning or advice given in an urgent matter, and consolation is comforting somebody who's in sorrow. According to verse 4, one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. How is the church edified? Well, God's word is taught and explained, which goes back to the definition of instruction or improving spiritual understanding. In verse 5, Paul explains that the church understanding God's word more fully is far more important than one person or several people speaking in such a way that no one else understands, unless someone interprets. Now picking up with verse 6. And through... Verse 12, but now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or of knowledge or of prophecy or of teaching? Yet even lifeless things, either the flute or the harp in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the notes, how will it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? For if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So you also, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world, and no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be to the one who speaks a barbarian, and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church." Notice how in verse 6, the prophecy is included with revelation, knowledge, and teaching, adding to the idea that here, prophecy is used 
not in terms of future events, but of explaining or interpreting the Word of God. Paul then uses the example of musical instruments, the harp, the flute, the bugle. If they are playing a combination of notes that you don't recognize, certainly doesn't mean as much as if they played a song that you know. Imagine being a soldier in those days. The bugle played specific songs or sequences that meant specific things to the soldier. How will you know when to attack or to defend unless the message is clear from the bugle? In the same way, tongues cause confusion for the hearer unless the meaning is made clear. If it, it will be as if words were just being muttered into the air without meaning. Paul's reference here to the barbarian is just like speaking to someone who doesn't understand your language. It's very frustrating. Several years ago, I was in Italy as part of my job, and a friend of mine were trying to interpret the train schedule, which was, of course, printed in Italian. We sought the help uh, from a couple who didn't speak English. So we didn't speak Italian. They didn't speak English. And it was very, very frustrating because we couldn't quite communicate exactly what we wanted. In that same way, speaking a tongue when nobody understands what's going on, it's very frustrating for the hearer. Now in verse 12, Paul acknowledges that they are zealous to have and to use spiritual gifts. But he exhorts the church in all that they do to edify the church. Speaking in tongues edifies the speaker. Prophecy edifies the church. Notice that he doesn't prohibit speaking in tongues, but in the next several verses, he'll give some instructions about how it should be done. So now on to verse 13 through 19. Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how will one who fills the place of the ungifted say, Amen, at your giving of thanks, since he does not know what you're saying? For you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. However, in the church, I desire to speak five words from my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, Paul acknowledges that some in the Corinthian church will speak in tongues. He doesn't forbid it. He acknowledges it, but he directs that there should be some interpretation. One of the spiritual gifts is, as we discussed, the interpretation of tongues. And Paul indicates that the speaker should pray that he interprets. However, it could be that another has the gift of interpretation. Either way, when the, when the speaker interprets or whether someone else interprets, there should not be confusion in the worship service, and that's the key. There should never be confusion in the worship service. In verses 14 to 16, Paul distinguishes between the mind and the spirit, and he introduces the use of the term ungifted. Now, scholars generally believe that this can be a number of possibilities. They could be unbelievers. They could be visitors. They could be illiterate, as was very common in that day. Or it could be just someone who does not understand what is happening. Either way, they are not edified by what's going on. 
If they're not edified, how can they agree or grow in maturity? Now to the distinction between the mind and the spirit. I'm not saying that that's what's going on here, but I am reminded of what Paul wrote to the Roman church in chapter 8, verse 26. There he told the Romans, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, when our mind doesn't know how to pray or even what to pray about, the Holy Spirit within us is never confused about what the needs are. So Paul finishes here by reminding the Corinthians of his ability to speak in tongues more than any of them. He doesn't do this to brag or boast, but to remind the church that what is done in the worship service should edify the body and glorify God. It should instruct, it should encourage, it should build up the believers. It should not be done to build up the ego of the one speaking in tongues. That was what was happening with some in the Corinthian church. Finally, in verse 20 to 25, Paul provides further explanation and instruction. Brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet be evil, yet, sorry, yet in evil, be infants. In your thinking, be mature. In the law, it is written, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people. And even so, they will not listen to me, said the Lord. So then, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is for a sign, not to believers, but to those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues, the ungifted men or unbelievers will enter, and they will not say, won't they say that you're mad? But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, and he is convicted by all, and he is called to account by all, the secrets of the heart would be disclosed, and so then he would fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God certainly is among you. So he is continuing to encourage them in spiritual maturity. He is encouraging innocence when it comes to worldly activity or evil, but he's encouraging maturity in spiritual matters. Remember, pre previously in chapter 3, he told them that they were not able to handle spiritual food, but could only handle the milk of the gospel. There was jealousy and there was strife in the Corinthian church. People often ask, what is God's will for me? Well, the answer is this. God's will for us is that we grow in maturity, that we are conformed to the image of his son. That is God's will for each one of us. In verse 21, Paul quotes from the Old Testament, from Isaiah 28, and from Deuteronomy. This showed Israel's stubbornness. They would not listen. The Corinthians were continuing to show stubbornness and immaturity. They weren't listening either. That's why Paul had to correct them. And in 22 through verse 25, he further explains the purpose of each. Speaking in tongues is a sign for unbelievers, but prophecy is a sign for the believer. If the whole church gathers 
together and everyone is speaking in tongues, the unbeliever or the visitor will think everyone is crazy. But if people are speaking God's word, the Spirit will use that for conviction. In Isaiah 55, God promised that his word would not return void. He will receive the worship and the glory. So, in summary, Paul here uses the first part of chapter 14 in contrasting two of the spiritual gifts, prophecy and speaking in tongues. Prophecy is for teaching and for encouragement, for comfort, for warning, and to build up the believer and the church. Speaking in tongues is an individual interaction between the believer and the Lord. Unless there is interpretation, the church is not edified. The Corinthians were commanded to desire spiritual gifts as the Holy Spirit chooses. May we also use the spiritual gift or gifts that the Lord has given us. May we use them for his glory and to advance his kingdom. Please join me in closing prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the tremendous blessings that you have provided for us. We thank you that you sent your Son. We thank you for him going to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, that relationship with you would be restored. Strengthen us as we speak your truth to be a witness to those that you bring into our lives. You are worthy of worship and praise. In your Son's precious and holy name, we pray. Amen.